Our first presenter this morning is Dr. Larry Ronan, who's an internist at Mass General Hospital, one of about 50 Mass General staffers who went to Haiti within 24 hours of the earthquake in January of 2010. He's worked for years with Project Hope and the U.S. Navy hospital ship Comfort, which was his assigned base during the immediate aftermath of the Haiti earthquake. Dr. Larry Ronan, please. I'll be brief. I'm Larry Run, as, as I've been introduced. Um, I have served in a lot of disasters, Indonesia, uh, Katrina, and most recently Haiti, and working now in the J Japanese uh, disaster. Um, most of my role has been as a, as a civilian within the military context. So, for example, in Tsunami, I worked on the, the Mercy with the Navy uh, through Project Hope, and then in Katrina, I was with the Uniform Public Health Service. And my particular area of interest is the military-civilian uh, coming together uh, during this, these times. Um, disasters, and I'll just go briefly for people who are not disaster responders or are unfamiliar with it. Disasters uh, occur, obviously, all the time. Um, they, they should have somewhat of a planned response on the part of the government, and ours has a very well-planned response. J Japan has a very well-planned response. Haiti was entirely different. Haiti was so exceptional because Haiti had nothing to start and then it had this and had to deal with this on top of it. So it was completely, a country completely unprepared for what it was to face. Um, contrast that with Japan right now, which is a very controlled, very capable, and very, very well-trained country to, to, to uh, deal with response. Um, I don't know if Kerry and other people are here, but Japan requested no military or civilian international uh, help. They had probably uh, the biggest disaster we've seen in at least this decade. They requested no outside military civilian disaster response from international partners. Um, they were able to deal with their disaster. They're dealing with it now. Some of that may not be as accurate uh, as, as uh, reported, but Haiti, to contrast that, had no response whatsoever. Haiti was an open door. If you were a, um, a chiropractor from Texas, or a massage therapist from Canada, you could go to Haiti within 24 hours to help the Haiti victims. Contrast those two uh, disasters and those two environments, if you will, uh, to sort of understand what we were talking about where Haiti. Haiti's a very unusual thing. That also includes the media. You had more media in Haiti from everywhere. Everyone said he was a journalist or she was a journalist, and everyone said he was a doctor or a nurse, what have you. My particular role in it was uh, within 24 hours of, within six hours of the disaster, the military engages, the U.S. military engages in its response to whatever a disaster is going to be, whether it's Chile or Japan or, in this case, Haiti. Um, and it comes up with a plan, and it's obviously a coordinated plan with HHS. I won't go into all the acronyms or all the processes. It's not important for this topic. But there's a well-planned uh, response pretty much after 9-11. And we've had a well-planned sort of uh, national response to disaster, whether it's domestic or international. My particular role is they, the, once the military is called in, they'll often look to civilian partners to augment uh, the military. We're at war. We have many of our military medical cap uh, capabilities in Afghanistan, Iraq, what have you. They'll often turn to NGOs uh, and civilians to help with the, uh, the response. So I joined the, the Comfort. The Comfort, you saw the uh, Carl Vincent. We had, uh, our government decided to throw everything it had within its resources at that earthquake as fast as possible. We had 22 ships there, 22 uh, ships from Southcom and from the South Fleet. It was a huge, huge military effort. We spent 50 to $60 million on that. We had the aircraft carrier there, three destroyers, and then we brought the hospital ship down the Comfort, which had huge capability. My role, uh, the hospital ship uh, for our government is what responds to large international disasters. It has 600 beds, it has surgeons, uh, it has capability for pediatrics. We can do very complicated cases. We are able to um, basically do what a Mass General Hospital is able to do. So that's what our role is. My role on that ship, however, is I use the helicopters. I go out and do um, search and rescue. That's a bad word. We're called the rapid assessment team. What we basically do is we try to find out landing zones in areas where we can evacuate people and assist the people that are on the ground. I'll take my last five minutes to talk about the, 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 our relationship with the reporters. I had no clue as to how that all worked. We, in our initial disasters, there were very few reporters, the tsunami and uh, other disasters. That you, could, you could never find a reporter. It was just not a part of our world. In Haiti, when we boarded the ship and it was in chaos, we were, everything was in chaos, 
We're boarding the ship. We're probably putting a thousand people on a ship within about 12 hours. Huge amount of work to be done. All of a sudden, this whole crew comes on board with cameras and notebooks, and we turn around. The Marines turn around and say, "Who are these people?" And it was the first disaster I've been in, in which we basically took on board and embedded reporters, and they were going to be a part of our mission. And I'll say a few things about that. I mean, we, in many ways, the people who do the response and the responders out here, we have no training to work with reporters, and that's an issue. And we need to maybe talk about it at this conference. Um, the second thing is the, the reporters and a lot of the people who came with us, they had no training with us, all right? So they didn't bring their malaria pills and they didn't bring their sunscreen and they didn't bring water <laughs> and we didn't know we had to take care of them. Uh, we didn't know what to do with them I mean, in some sense. So there was sort of a, a, a kind of coming together. Having said that, they were wonderful people to be with and actually were very, and I'll make my own little comment, I worked with Bob Little from the Baltimore Sun and a little bit with Deborah Sontag. They were the most respectful people. They worked extremely well with us, and they did really, really good work with us. Having said that, they often drifted away from our security zones. They were using their cell phones at times. We didn't want them to use it, and they were doing things outside what I call our incident command structure. So what I'm going to raise for the, the panel are a number of questions having to do with disaster people, medical people, military people, and I wish we had a military sort of presence here, um, working with people who are embedded, and I think it's true in war and it's, it's true in disaster zones. Um, how people report on individual events can influence the way the world sees that moment. Okay, and I'll just give one example. I saw from Carrie's talk um, uh, the food distribution, which was violent. This is from a person who does a lot of this stuff and sees a lot of this stuff. That was an isolated incident. There was some violence. The, the food distribution by the UN, and I'm highly critical of the UN most of the time, was done superbly in this disaster. That was a terrible moment when people are getting it, but for the most part, food was distributed in a way I've never seen it distributed before. It's been assessed publicly, okay, in other words, people who do this kind of thing for a living looked at it and said, geez, that was a great victory, but it looked like chaos, and it was sort of chaos there at that moment, but actually the context was, was sort of out of context. The food distribution program in Haiti was done extremely well, and it was actually very peaceful. The Haitians were terrific, waited in line, everything was, it was a little different from what you saw. But what you saw is what we saw in the United States. Second thing is how embedded journalists actually influence individual behavior. Which child we take to bring on board? What person gets to go to the United States? If, if you think that a person with a camera, NBC News, or uh, you know, a reporter from the New York Times, is not influencing how people act in the field as they're watching you, that's something we should talk about. And that's an ethical issue if you want to talk about that. Having a large media presence in these events can influence policy at a very, very large level. You saw Barth Green, Dr. Barth Green. I knew, I, I know this is very weird. There were 10,000 people in that response, but I knew half the people they were there with, Dr. Barth Green from the University of Miami. Um, you can actually influence, and the power positively and negatively of influencing policy um, around issues like uh, taking people out of country. Excuse me, I want to call. Um, so I'd like to raise that as an issue as well. It, it, in that story, for example, um, the airlifts actually did stop. That's the story that he, so it wasn't a good news story, it was a bad news story, and they probably stopped for the right reason. And we can talk about what that right reason may be. And it has to do a little bit with what, uh, what the dean from the School of Public Health said, which is, do you take 500 people out and take care of them, or do you turn to 2.5 million people and take care of them? And those are decisions the policy makers have to make but if you have NBC News and ABC News looking at one aspect of that, they may shift their resources toward something which may or may not be the, uh, the appropriate thing. Um, and lastly, I, I'll raise a question which is, um, which may be controversial, but should there be some credentialing and preparedness training for uh, first responder reporters coming into the field? And that, and that, and that I'm, I'm uh, the credentialing part, anyone and his uncle, anyone and her or aunt could come in to report on Haiti. And is that appropriate? when people are going through these kinds of things. Is that appropriate to a host government? I'll just contrast that with Japan. The reporters got to the Japanese area, only let the Japanese let them. They controlled that environment. But Haiti was vulnerable. Haiti was a poor, vulnerable country, and their, their borders were porous, coming down from Dominican Republic, coming across the airway. Should we not have some sort of professional obligation, a first responder certainly, but also for reporters, that they should be prepared? Not coming with your malaria medicine tasked us not understanding incident command structure and, and going outside your security perimeters 
tasked us. It took our resources away, and we had to pay attention to that. So I'd raise that's the last issue, and we can talk more about it.